So now we're in the portion that is the members meeting. So welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen and show the agenda for this particular meeting. Okay. So the agenda today is the welcome, of course. Paul, is, have you prepared, been able to prepare the photo montage? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Just looking for it. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And, and then following his photo montage, um, Paul will give his presentation on the RAS calendar from front to back. And back to front. Sorry. Both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, um, I got so many files open here. I'm just trying to hop around. No problem. Uh, and then Paul Heath will do a youth presentation. I'll let him introduce it. It's, it's a rather intriguing one. I'll then do the news from the board, and that should actually be December skies, not November. I apologize, Dave. Um, and then following that with, uh -oh. the, with the adjournment, uh, we will then go into the Astro chat for an hour whenever that particular, um, whenever that all the information we're presenting is, is ended, we'll go for an hour later. And people are welcome to stay, keeping in mind that um, the Astro chat is not recorded. It is strictly offline. So for those of you that wish to stay and discuss anything and everything under the sun, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, the rest of the members meeting is certainly recorded uh, and will be available as will the AGM video be uh, on a separate video be available on our Halifax Center YouTube channel. Um, okay, so at this point, I, I guess I will escape. I will pass it over to you, uh, Paul, to do the montage. All right, uh, bear with me here while I try to share my screen and see if I can find the right screen to share because I have multiple files open and dual screens running. There we go. There we go. It was a busy couple of months for MERS anyway. A lot of people got a lot of MERS images and sketches and uh, some stuff in the sun. None of these images are in any particular order this month. I did not take the time to go through and put everything in chronological order as the, the weeks went by. So it's just a scattered mixing of everything. Um, not much deep sky the last month and a half. I guess the weather's been pretty crappy, but I see we've had the chances to take opportunity of uh, MERS. I know uh, a few of us got out in a few evenings when it was clear by chance and didn't last long. I think last October, November, I had like 25 nights in two months and this year I've had two. It's been crazy. Certainly not as good as the summer months. No, summer was amazing. It's, it's uh, really amazing how the weather patterns change. And right now we're back into a real deep winter pattern where every four to five days we're going to get a big system. So until that breaks, uh, it's going to be interesting. I guess we just have to stop buying gear. Yeah, whose fault is it this time? I, I got to take credit for at least one week. Okay. Well, is, is getting new equipment to pass on to someone else count? That counts twice when you get it and when you pass it on to them. <laughs> oh, boy. For being science-based, evidence-based uh, folks, we're a pretty superstitious lot. Right back. Says the man who burns telescopes in effigy. That was only once. <laughs> In fact, we made one and then somebody stole it before we had a chance to build it or to burn it. Can you see the difference? Yep. <laughs> Very subtle. I've always told my first year students, do not go out to see a penumbral eclipse. Well, I have to say, this is the best I've seen Mars in 30 years of observing. 
except for that one. This year was great. <laughs> the last time Mars was this well placed for us, I had a 60 millimeter Tasco. Makes a difference. Never pick on such fine quality optical equipment. But it was still only a 60 millimeter. <laughs> you can only do so much with 60 millimeters for magnification. I can do a lot more with 190 and a Mac new. But of course, the price difference is what, 20 fold? I don't know. Tascos weren't cheap in their day. No, they weren't. The front glass was good, but it was still small. Yeah, there is uh, that comment about, you know, I have a camera lens bigger than that. Yep. <laughs> I don't, I just wish I did. Or an eyepiece. That I might have. Cool. Peekaboo. Yep. That's that. Good work, everybody. Yay. All right. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. So I can get my cursor back over there. So, do you want a formal introduction, Paul? If you want to do one, sure. If not, no. I'll just keep going. <laughs> okay. How do how do we introduce someone that we've known for many years? Um, yeah. Um, Suffice to say that the Paul has been an astro imager for probably as long as he's been observing uh, and has produced some incredible photographs. And, and I think we've seen um, examples lately of you um, what I want, reprocessing some of your earlier shots. So at that end, and keep in mind that Paul's presentation is regarding the RAS calendar. And he's been the editor for the last nine. Nine? nine of them and you've got one more to go is that correct yes uh so I, I think he knows the subject well and uh with no further ado i will let you tell us how do we read this wonderful critter called the ras calendar thanks judy actually i'm going to tell you a bit of two things one how to read it two how it's put together when the topic first came up a number of months ago there was a question as to can you tell us how how it's assembled how this whole contraption of a calendar is put together because you don't just go somewhere and say download all the data as one thing and fill it in the blanks and off you go to a printer. It's got to be compiled. It's got to be checked. It's not always compiled completely and it's not always checked thoroughly enough to not get errors in it as well. So as, as much as we try both with the observer's handbook and the observer's calendar, there always seems to be um, something creeping up somewhere that's, uh, that's incorrect. As hard as I try, that uh, some nights it makes me want to go get a drink after I'm done and uh, just give up for another day and go back to it. So I'll, I told Judy I'd call this can this uh, little talk uh, front to back and back to front, actually. That is, I want to show you how to read the calendar front to back, but I want to show you from the back end how this thing is put together and what we produce. But to get going, we will start off with how do you use your calendar? Number one, take it out of the packaging and hang it on the wall. Uh, Put it out there where people can see it and so other people will want it. Uh, that's the biggest thing I can say is, is use it. It's no good sitting in a pile on the desk. Um, many of you might already have this year's uh, 2021. Let's see if we can show my camera. There it is. Yeah. I'm actually going to bring it up on the screen. I'm going to share my screen again here. And I'm going to bring up uh, the PDF version that went to print. So you should be getting to see the calendar as a PDF. You'll notice on the edges, there's some colored colored squares and gray squares for tones and there's clip lines, top and bottom. Um, so yeah, th this is what we send to the printer. Um, Mike Gatto's the layout guy. Many thanks to him. I can't uh, say enough about all the volunteers. Mike Gatto, especially for the effort he puts in. Uh, I think the hours he puts in is probably getting close to what I put in on it. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. For, for everyone, actually. We have a number of volunteers, which I'll mention in a minute. So getting right into it, I would say, open to your first page, or we'll look at the first page and wonder, what are you seeing here? And 
I often tell people before they do that, go to the back of the calendar. I'm going to scroll way down here and we'll get to the second last page. It loads up. Sorry, yes, the third last page, which is the inside back cover. And there's actually a whole page that tells you how to use this counter and our uh, calendar. And I'm not going to read through it line by line, but basically the the gist of it is it's it begins off by telling you about the 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 moon, the moon phases, it tells you about the the times for the the sunrise and sunset times, and it tells you the summer of naked eye, visibility, the position of the planets. And then it goes on to tell you about uh, the astronomical events that are listed at the bottom as well, and how to adjust the calendar times for your location. And the adjustments for location are really only critical if you're looking at sunrise, sunsets, or the moonrise, moonset times, because they are delayed, of course, based on how far west of your meridian that you're located in. And there's a nice table here. Um, in the calendar that will, for most cities in Canada, for Halifax, for example, um, the correction is plus 14 minutes. So for your sunrise, sunset times in the calendar, uh, you look at what they are in the grid, add 14 minutes to those, and that's pretty much the, the change from the eastern side of our meridian that we're in of our time zone to the location of Halifax. Of course, I'm in Greenwood, probably another three or four minutes west, uh, so I would have to have those to mind, but I could calculate that if I wanted to. If you want to use it just for a general idea, the times and the grids are, are pretty pretty much it. We'll come, I'm not going to come back to this page. I will have it open so I can kind of keep it as a reference here for me. The only other thing that's really important on this page is for planning purposes, for those of us to take trips either to the south to see the southern skies, to star parties, for those planning star parties, there's always these other two grids, 2021 and 2022. We always put these in so you can see the year as a whole for the current year and here's a whole for the future year. And if I zoom in on it here, you'll notice that there is some blue highlighted dates. These are the dates of the new moon within the grid for the next two years. So you can quickly take a look going ahead of year and see when the new moon dates are and when you want to either plan your star party or plan a trip somewhere dark if you want to go camping. It's not a star party or something like that, just to do some deep sky observing or imaging. So without getting into too much detail there. I'm going to go back to the top of the calendar. We'll go into January and we'll use that as our example. Um, so this is January 2021 coming up next year. Um, of course, the top of the page is your description. Now you're going to wonder why the description is here and the calendar covers there. And the actual photo for January is below it. Uh, it's just the way the layout is done for going to the printers. But the top of the page is your description of the photo that's on that particular facing plate. Uh, Normally these are written just to give you a bit of an idea of what the object is, what's interesting about it, or, or what's going on in, in, in the image. It's really more for the beginners or the, the unknowing astronomers or the, the non-astronomers out there say, what is that? Um, and, uh, it's just a bit of an educational tool. Of course, at the top we have our, year, our month, so you know what month you're in, then have your days of the week across the top. And then normally at the top or bottom, depending on where the space is, we have the planets by month. And this is your quick description of where are the naked eye planets this month? Uh, where can you find them? So a very quick reference if you want to know what's going on or where are they at. And as you can see, Jupiter and Saturn are both very low in the southwest after sunset and lost in twilight by mid-month. So this is January that, that'll be lost. Of course, we know they're going to be very low in the southwest at the end of this month. And, and there's the conjunction coming up on the 21st. But, um, so looking ahead, this will give you an idea. Creating those is an interesting thing, and I'll come back to that when I do a little bit about how we how we come up with that. So looking at the grid, uh, we'll start with January 1st, just to give you an idea of what's in a typical grid. Of course, there's the moon uh, phase at the top left. The, the phase is shown by the day, every day of the year, so you have an idea of what the moon phase is. There's also um, this phase. It's hard to tell looking at the calendar. But if you were to compare one phase to another phase two weeks apart, you can actually see that there is a size difference in these graphics. And that is based on the, the um, orbit of the moon being elliptical and taking it further away from us and closer to us. So you can get a sense for whether it's bigger or smaller um, if you look closely at the images. More importantly is the little black dot. The little black dot is actually the, the point on the edge of the moon or the, the part of the edge of the moon that is 
favorably liberated towards us. So this is the apparent rocking motion left and right, up and down of the moon as it goes through its orbit. That's actually just a visual thing from our point of view. Uh, it's, it's, it's an effect that's caused by the speeding up and slowing down of the moon in its elliptical orbit where it's slightly gets ahead of us, slightly gets behind us, slightly goes below the plane or above the plane. And you can see around one edge or the other edge of the top edge, the bottom edge of the moon. But this uh, apparent motion kind of this wobble is descriptive here by showing you with the dot. And the larger the dot or the smaller the dot, the less the elaboration. So even here you can see it's a very little dot. So it's not wobbled or tilted quite towards us. We don't have that effect happening. Whereas if you go a week later, the dots are quite large. And even a week earlier, the dots are quite, quite a bit large. And you notice over the months that the dot rotates itself around the moon. So when you get down here, it's already up to the right side, coming up to the, to the top of the moon. And when you come back here, it's near the top and it rotates. That's just the, the motion of the moon, the way it works with our orbits. It's a orbital oddity, so to speak, but um, you can get a sense for how the what part of the moon's facing more towards and you can see over that edge. I'm not going to go into the whole background on the science behind a lot of these ideas, but that's what it is. Uh, the next thing at the top of your grid calendar is the 40 degrees north, 50 degrees north, moon rise and moon set times. So the set times are at the top and the rise times are at the bottom. And there's two here. Uh, one is for 40 degrees latitude, one is for 50 degrees latitude because it will vary on how far north of the equator you are. So we put the two times in here so you can see, uh, depending on whether you're in Western Canada and you're further north or here in the Eastern part of the country, Ontario and the Maritimes and further south, um, what the time is. So again, this is the time that you would have to add your correction from the back of the counter to. So if it's rising, say, we'll, we'll assume we're at 40 north, we're a little, we're about 43, but somewhere around 42, 43, depending on in, in Southern Nova Scotia anyway, um, set time is 10.05. If you're in Halifax, you'd have to add 14 minutes to that. So your moon set time on the 2nd of January would be roughly 10.19 10, uh, in the day. And the rise time would be 20.30, which means the rise time now moves to 20.44. And then at the end of the week, on the last day, of, on the Saturday of each grid, there is the sunrise sunset time. And we do these by the week. They don't change a whole lot day to day but it does change by a minute or two, a couple minutes each week. So you'll see that down the right side that there's set times. Uh, holidays are listed in the bottom in bold of each grid. And then if you move on forward, you get into, there's a section here where we have events. So here the quadrant meteor shower is, is listed with its zenith hourly rate of 120. And we give a time as well, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, we get those times from the International Meteor Organization. Um, from their annual production. They do an annual calendar. And uh, we put the times in where it's best seen in North America. For this case, 10 a.m., it's best seen in early hours in the Western North America. And that's because the quadrantids have a very short peak of four hours. And 10 a.m., that's Eastern time, by the way. All the times are in the, for these events are listed as Eastern Standard Time. So you have to add an hour to get to Atlantic time. So that's 11 a.m. Atlantic time. The event's only four hours long. It's daylight for us. So therefore, that's why we list it as best seen in the early morning hours in Western North America or West of North America. There's some other interesting things. Uh, Fall Arcturus unaided into daylight this week. So uh, there's a lot of neat little observing challenges within the calendar like that. If you go out during twilight in the morning and, and watch Arcturus, uh, you can see it during twilight and you can watch as the day, as the sky brightens. And eventually, as the sun rises, if you keep looking at our tourists, you can actually see it in the daylight. So there, there's some neat stuff like that. Moving forward, all the quarters of the phases of the moon, the new moon, first quarter, last quarter, <clears throat> full moon are listed with the time given in, in uh, Eastern time as well for, for the, the time of the event. So that's throughout the calendar. And then, of course, uh, we also list other events like the Lunar Curtis X, the, the, the Werner X, as well as the Straight Wall are, are listed throughout. Uh, when the Moon is at Perigee or Apogee is listed in here, which gives you large tides, uh, depending on the time of year and whether the Moon is close to a, a pillion or perihelion. Uh, 
other interesting things, uh, conjunctions are listed. For example, Mer Mercury, Mer or Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn will form a large triangle on the 10th of January. However, as we noted earlier, they're all going to be very, very low in the uh, western sky then. So it'll be very difficult, but it will be neat to see. Other interesting events that are listed are the crescent moons, the young moons, and the old moons. So one of the challenges in the observing program, the Williamson Lunar Program, is seeing a young moon less than 24 hours old. Um, so we often list those based on what part of the country you're in. So for example, um, the young moon 16 hours after noon in the east, but 21 hours after noon in the west, because from from eastern to the western coast, you got a five hour time change. So to get to the twilight time when you have that young moon on the west coast, the moon is five hours older. Yeah, normal state planetary information, whether they're stationary, whether they're in conjunction, whether an opposition is listed throughout the calendar. Uh, there's the lunar X near Crater Verna at 2 p.m. I started listing that one actually for daytime hours, partly because it's actually an object that can be seen in the daylight. Uh, numerous features on the moon are daylight objects, so it's, uh, I figured why not? The only time I don't list them now is if they're not visible from North America. The majority of the events in the calendar is geared towards North American observers. So if the Lunar X was going to be in a time zone that's in Asia or Europe, not visible here, we wouldn't list it. Um, the green triangles. What are the green triangles for? We we use the green triangles to highlight uh, events that are rather significant or interesting or um, I wouldn't say rare, but kind of the best of. For example, this one, uh, we put it in for the January greatest elongation of Mercury. Um, and the reason we did it for this particular one is because it is the best one of the year. Mercury is not easy to see. It's always very low, except for once or twice a year, maybe once in the evening, once in the morning. So we highlight the best morning and the best evening elongation of Mercury. And this year that occurs in January. So if you've never seen Mercury, January is probably your best bet to do it this year. Um, at the bottom or the top, depending on where the space is available, we do list the uh, month before the month after, as per most calendars. And then, of course, there's a bit of instructions at the bottom as well as about how to use the uh, daily boxes, how they're all in the 24-hour clock. But the times at the bottom are often given in 12-hour clock and how uh, Eastern time is used, except for rise and set events, which are local time. But you, of course, have to add your correction to that local time. The other thing I see at the bottom here, and I don't see another one early in the month, but uh, way down here on the 31st of uh, January, Apollo 13 launched 50 years ago, third crew landing. Uh, historical dates, Dave Chapman and uh, Diane um, Brooks, uh, both local members here in Halifax, are, are great contributors to the calendar for many years. And I've been doing historical dates since long before I took the calendar over. I think Dave Lane, they were doing it for you for five or 10 years. So um, they have a great list of uh, events that come up every, every 5, 10, 20, 25 uh, years that they provide me with. Uh, they each send me a doc, uh, Word document. Uh, about this time of the year, I'll be looking for it and I start work on next year's calendar. That is 2022 calendar and uh, um, get all the historical dates. Did I miss anything? Dave? You're muted, Dave. Hello? Who's, who are you asking? Oh, sorry, Dave Chapman. What was the question? I was asking Dave Chapman if I missed anything on the uh, grid. Oh, I don't know. Dave Lane, I mean. On the what? I was asking Dave Lane, sorry, if I missed anything on the uh, calendar grid. Well, I'm trying to remember what the little green uh, marker is that it's that's just highlighted highlighted the day. interesting events yeah highlighted day yeah yeah highlighted days that's right so that's the gist of what happens on the grid um are there any questions about the grids or what's in the grid boxes or how to read them because if there's any questions i'll i'll do that right now if not i'll move back to the back of the calendar and mention some of the other information that's there uh, i, I have a question so. yep um, this is Dave Chapman speaking. Um, so uh, you mentioned that 
as I know, it's very difficult to produce a handbook or a calendar without errors. Um, and uh, in the handbook case, we have like a page where people can go for uh, extra information and corrections. Is there something like that for the calendar? We've never actually created one. Normally, it's one or two things. It's and it's it's yeah. It's not where you have a page in the handbook that had a set of data that was wrong and needs to be, you know. It's it's okay. I, I just I guess we could. I mean, there is a calendar page on the RSU website. We could easily put a put a section at the bottom of that. You know, corrections for 2021. Here they are. Um, yeah, I guess we had an issue there just a little while ago about the uh, penumbral eclipse. Um, yeah. I was actually going to mention that later on, but uh, yeah, yeah, for the, those who aren't aware, the the penumbral eclipse a few days ago on the 30th of December, for somehow or another, had there was a typo in the in the master spreadsheet, which I'll show you in a minute when I compile all the data. And instead of hitting the three, my my little finger hit the two. <laughs> um, so the 20th came into the calendar as the the date of the, the the information about the penumbral eclipse. And of course, when I check all the information in the calendar grid back against my master spreadsheet, it matched. Yeah. But until you look at the calendar grid and say, oh, why is the eclipse on a day when the moon's not, moon's not full? Uh, then it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the amazing thing is we went through four different proof checks, four different proofs were sent to us from Michael uh, with corrections and stuff that we've gone through. We, we proved it, we sent him corrections, he made corrections, we yeah. read through it again. And not one of me or my proofreaders saw that the penumbral eclipse was on a day that the full moon wasn't full. Um, yeah, sometimes you look at it so much, it just it's hard to see the mistakes. I mean, what I, I mean, I would always check the main phases of the moon, but then you wouldn't you wouldn't have picked up on the lack no, of that's it. right. Yeah, and I, you know, I make it a, a a pact. Actually, when I go through the grid, when I'm looking at the proof, I actually go through day by day, looking at that little dot showing the libration of the moon to make sure that it's consistently going around in the circle that it's supposed to. Because there was one year, somehow the data got messed up. And a week and a half later, it started to repeat again. You know what? Uh, I made a big goof in one of the handbooks. Luckily, it was in January. So the, the good thing about making um, a mistake like that is once it's over, it doesn't matter anymore. That's right. <laughs> so it's early in the year, it's over with. Nobody's going to notice it. So I made I made a mistake on um, something to do with Jupiter's moons, but it was in January. So, uh, you know, we, we, we mentioned that, hey, you know, this is a mistake. But then I, when January is over, I'd breathe the big sigh of relief because like nobody would be looking at that. That's right. Didn't All right. Uh, so moving forward, actually, I'm going to show um, one of the mistakes that is in this year's calendar. Uh, it's, I've already been told there's a mistake. It's, it's obvious um, if you know what you're looking at. But at the time, it, it was not to me. And there's a reason for that. I'm going to zoom out here. So oh, where did it go? There we go. This is actually the image for June. Beautiful object down in the Southern Hemisphere. Many of us probably know what of it is. Many of us probably have an idea that it's one object or another. I'm going to scroll back up because, of course, the description for that object is on the previous plate for April. So that's actually sort of the image for April. Um, so there's the description. The Tarantula Nebula, and the Large Magellanic Cloud is one of the most extensive H2 regions in our local group of galaxies. The Tarantula Nebula dwarfs the Orion Nebula. And if placed where the ladder is, its light would cast shadows during night on Earth. Image by Keith Egger, who's actually lived down the road from me here in, in Bridgetown. So, does anybody see what's wrong? Wrong object. Wrong object. That's the Trifid. No. No. That's Eta Carnae. Ah. It's the Eta Carnae Nebula with the description for the tarantula. Paul, did you ever hear that the uh, double shadow transits were initially done wrong? Yes, they did. And Is they're that... actually not in here. <laughs> they were dropped. Yeah. Good. So thank you, though. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, what happened here is, is 
Keith Edgar actually sent me two images, one of the tarantula and one of Ada Kearney. And I could not decide which one I wanted to use. And I was going to wait till I hear from Mike Gatto when he did the layout as to which one he felt had the better reproduction uh, part capabilities going to the printer, what he was happy with putting in. And when he selected the photo and told me which one to send him, I sent him it. But I had descriptions written for both objects. And I sent him the, the document file with the descriptions with the tarantula instead of a decarna. And you would think, well, when it goes to the proofreaders, they're going to catch that, right? We should have. However, none of my proofreaders, including myself, have ever been south and have ever observed or looked at these objects to any extent beyond, oh, that's that object in a book. And I've never really taken note of it. And I just completely did not realize we sent the wrong information. So, but to date, that's the only mistake I know of. <laughs> so, so going to the back of the calendar, uh, lots of great images this year. Uh, probably one of the best years for images we've had in the nine years I've been doing it. I love them. Um, this one's from Kimberly Sibold, uh, Grand Canyon National Park, I believe it is. Um, one of our own locals, Jason Dane, uh, the, the Royal Fuchi Ofuka complex with M4 and M80s in there. And of course, all the dark nebulas of the prancing horse up on end. And it's really detailed. I mean, Bernard's S is right in there as well. Just a spectacular image. Even more spectacular, this was shot from Nova Scotia. Um, you know, like these are things that you do when you go south. Uh, yeah, great images this year. I can't say enough about the stuff. Uh, this one I'm really happy to have in here. It doesn't quite have the 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 pinks and the the reds you get from a from a a CCD camera or a or a modified DSLR. It's it's more natural from an unmodified camera. But this is from our youth member down down here in Nova Scotia, um, Fiona Morris and. Uh, She's doing some amazing work. This is a, one of our teenage members here, and she's just doing amazing work uh, starting off as a young astronomer. So it's been so nice to have a youth member in the calendar and, and to have uh, another lady uh, submit her as well for images. Uh, yeah, so images were just spectacular. Uh, of course, the cover shot. Um, I actually had a cover chosen, and we had printed all the material for promotion and they had posted on websites and stuff what the cover was going to be back in about May or April and then this comet came around the summer and all of a sudden I started receiving photos in July of Comet Neowise and it was really tough uh, to know that I had four weeks left of proof checking to do and the calendar was going to the press and we have this great spectacular comet. And in my nine years of doing the calendar, we had not had a great comet. So I finally get an opportunity to put a comet in the calendar. And I have already had all the photos chosen. And probably one of the toughest things I ever had to do was, one was I contacted one of my image uh, submitters who had already submitted a photo. And it wasn't too bad. She was OK uh, with my question as to, can I use your comment photo instead of your other photo that you sent me? Uh, so I was going to pull the photo she, she originally sent me for the calendar, but I was going to put another one of her photos in. So she was OK with that. And, and that's the other photo in here by Deborah Saravolo, the close up of the comment. I'm going to scroll back up to that one here. Um, where was it? Deborah's is. March. There it is. Um, the detail that she has captured in the core, and the shock wave, and it's probably not showing up here, but you can actually see a bow shock within here, just in front of the nucleus, and see the shadow of the nucleus and the tail. Um, Roy Bishop, I actually in, in uh, uh, 
involved Roy Bishop uh, with this year's calendar and had him write the caption for this photo because I wanted to do it justice uh, with the science that was going on in here. So when you get the opportunity and get your calendar, read what Roy says is happening in this photo. And uh, it's truly amazing. But uh, the other photo of the comet in here, which ended up being on the covers, one of Alan Dyer's. And I had actually had chosen a photo from another lady to be on the cover. And it really wrenched my gut. I, I knew I had to do it because I had to have this comet on the cover of, the, of this year's calendar. If I waited till next year, Comet Neo Wise would not be in the calendar until 2022. And by then it would be old news. So I, I had to do this. I called uh, the lady up and we talked about it and I told her what I was thinking. Uh, the minute I said I wanted to change the calendar photo, she said to me, she goes, you want to use Allen's, don't you? She knew exactly what I wanted to do and she knew why because she saw this photo and she knows Alan. She, she, she and Alan worked together quite a bit and uh, he's helped her a lot over the years and he's actually the one who recommended me to talk to her about getting some of her photos. And so she was like, by all means, go ahead and do it. I said, I'm going to keep her other photo for next year and I am going to use another one of her photos in this year. So she still has a photo in the calendar. Unfortunately, she lost the cover, but she understood. But I still felt really bad. Um, but I'm so pleased with the cover uh, having this comment on it. Uh, where are we at here? So back to the back page there, we already covered that. The next page, for those who want a little more detail on what happened or what the, uh, how the photos were taken, the inside of the back cover has a page that has all the photos and descriptions. I get the, the, the imagers to send me all their details, capture details, equipment and exposure and process details for their images. So you can go in there and read what they use to take those pictures and uh, what they did for it. So you can learn from that as well. And then of course, there's a list of all our contributors at the back and uh, who, who did all the different photos and also some information about the RAC. And then the back cover has all the, all the pretty pictures in this year's calendar. And again, I can't say enough about all the contributors uh, this year, especially the images. Like I said, they're outstanding. Kevin Black, Ron Brecher, Deborah Servolo, Jason Dane, Alan Dyer, Keith Edgar, Carrie Ann Hepburn, Fiona Morris, Paul Owen, and Kimberly Sibold. And I think what I'm really happy to see this year is of the imagers, that uh, you'll notice it's almost a 50-50 split with Wynn and the men this year submitting images to the calendar, uh, which is really nice to see. For a number of years, there's always been the question is, where are the women imagers? Um, but it's, it's nice to see they're, they're submitting photos now. Quite often in the past, um, they just wouldn't. Some of them wouldn't submit, and uh, it's taken some, some nudging by Alan Dyer and a few other people to a couple of these ladies to to send me some information or contact and say, would you be interested in checking out my webpage? I said, by all means, and, and I do, and I see some great work. So it's, it's really great. Of course, Diane and Dave uh, Chapman, Diane Brooks, Dave Chapman for the historical dates, James Edgar for proofreading. Michael does a lot of proofreading. Uh, I can't say enough about James Edgar. The man is a machine. Uh, Dave Chapman, you're probably aware of that. Uh, I sent uh, James Edgar an Excel file to proofread uh, 9, 10 o'clock my time here on the East Coast. I get up in the morning and it's done. Uh, it's truly amazing. I don't know where that man finds the time to proofread all the productions. And he was doing that while he was president a couple of years ago of the society too. So truly amazing. So anyway, that's the, um, the calendar in a nutshell as far as the calendar. Production, I'm going to take 10 minutes here and go over production. So I'm going to uh, go back to, I'm going to stop the share of that. And I'm going to share, um, where is it here? My master file. Okay, my master file. All right, you should see an Excel spreadsheet. Is that what's posted now? Somebody give me a nod. Sharing is paused. It's still starting up. Oh, it's still starting up. Let me know when it's there, Pat. Will do. It should be. I don't know why it's paused. Well, it says Paul Gray has started screen sharing. Yeah, but I'm lining and saying it's sharing is paused. Let me, I'm going to stop and try and reshare here. Actually, I'm just going to share screen one. Might be might be easier. See there now? you go. Ah, yeah, that's quicker. 
All right, uh, so I mentioned that chance. I compile everything into a spreadsheet. I get data from numerous sources, mostly from Dave Lane, uh, Alistair Lane. They both have software that was actually created by uh, Rajiv Gupta, who was the creator of the calendar back in the early 1990s, I believe 1993 or 1992, or 93, I think was the first national calendar. The two years before that, the Vancouver Center produced their own calendar. And then in 1993, it became the national calendar. And uh, so it's been around quite a while, but Rajiv created some spread, spread or so, uh, software. I forget what its program is. Now, is it C plus, Dave? Actually, none of his software is used anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, when he uh, cut ties with the RSC, he basically ordered us not to uh, not to use any of his code. So when we revamped the calendar, and uh, um, you know, I don't know. I guess it was during my tenure. We had to redevelop everything from scratch. Okay. So any of the files that I send you are actually uh, generated by code that comes from one way or another, the under the hood stuff in my Earth Center Universe Planetarium. Okay. So just to give you an idea what some of those are. Uh, for example, um, Dave Lane often sends me a. Uh, was it graphics? Uh, okay. the, the lower ones. The I lower think. ones down here. So like he'll often send me, um, it's just, an ex, just a text file, but it's all the sunrise and sunsets. So I don't really have to do a whole lot with these ones. These are basically brought together into a single folder. I send that stuff off to Mike. Uh, yeah, same those things phases. are actually formatted in such a way that Mike can simply Sort of put himself on January and then paste in, yeah, paste in this this file and it populates through his the whole month. So he, he doesn't have to do things manually and, and type a lot of stuff in. It just sort of copies and pastes. That's right. Um, the ones I do some stuff with are stuff from uh, Alistair Wang. I'll get files similar to this. Um, so this is 50 years of the. Uh, young old moon crescents and you can see down the list here there's 2017 2018 so if i scroll down actually i just grabbed the five years here but for 2021 for example there's the occurrences of the young moon or old moon crescent uh, phases and these are all within 24 hours of uh, new the the columns of importance are these three here because these are your your times that they occur at and i have to basically go through and look to see if uh, any of these occurrences occur in time zones over North America. I pull those out. I add them to my master file. But my master file is that Excel sheet. Where did it go? Right here. And everything goes into this, um, not in order to begin with, but it, I just put it in in blocks as I gather data. Um, I get uh, a file that has all the oppositions of objects. I get a file that has the apogees and perigees. Uh, I get a few other files. Uh, I get, of course, the the word file from Dave and Dave Chapman and Diane Brooks uh, for for um, historical dates, and uh, I, I'll manually take those out of the word file, put them in here, and then add the the month and day to to an event. And this whole thing gets comprised into this one big Excel spreadsheet with all the events. And if you sort it by 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 date, um, the very first column is tells you whether it's an important an event that should be at the top of a grid or at the bottom of a grid where the order of the grid goes in. So that's why some of them don't always occur perfectly. But in the end, this Excel sheet is again, one that Mike can take and you can start in January and it'll basically autofill through the months and the days of the year. And as you can see, if you scroll to the bottom, there are 294 events in the calendar spreadsheet for 2021. So there's a fair bit of information and data going on there. Uh, Interesting coming up next year, Yuri Gagarin, first human in space 60 years ago, coming up on the 60th anniversary of Gagarin's flight. It just, just seems like yesterday we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of that. So, uh, so yeah, this Excel sheet is one that I put together, then I proofread, I send it to James, he proofreads it. Um, uh, Jupiter with one satellite uh, in here as well. There's uh, star parties. One of the other things we do is, I. Uh, James and I both uh, contact all the star parties that are in the calendar or in the handbook throughout North America to try and arm twist out of them. What are your dates for your star party next year? 
not this year, because we're often doing this in the spring. So spring of 2021, I'm asking them, when are you doing your star party in 2022? And they're like, uh, we haven't even finished this year yet. So it's not always easy to get that out of them. And then, uh, yeah, so, so that's the Excel sheet. There, there's another Excel sheet that's cre it's created and it's called the planets by month. And this is an interesting one. Um, there's no place to go get what the planets by month are gonna be as a description in the way that we write it in the format that we use. And that is the, the low in the direction before or after sunset, whether it's lost or, or low in twilight by mid month or in month or whatever it may be. Uh, so these are created manually. I literally, uh, there is a one file that Dave, Dave Lane, I believe you put out uh, that I can go through and pull some of that data from. But I double check it simply by loading up Earth Centered Universe, uh, the planetarium program created by Dave Lane. And I lock on a planet and on a, on a direction and I go through month by month, uh, mid month to mid month, uh, basically seeing where is that planet located for the next 12 months. And I type in these descriptions and create them. Saturn's pretty easy. Jupiter's pretty easy. Year to year kind of all shifts by one month. There's no real big changes in where they're at in the sky. And, I mean, Jupiter, it's it's 12, month, or 12 years to go around the, around the sky once. So it's literally one zodiac sign per year that it's traveling. So you kind of bump it by a month and and uh, there you go. Mars gets a little hairy at times because of course it could be moving in retrograde and all of a sudden it, you know, it's no longer very low in the west, but it's only low in the west because of a retrograde motion or something like that or in the spring. Um, Venus is pretty easy because for the most part it's 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 up for a decent amount of time during one or two seasons that I go and then it of course goes into conjunction and pops up on the other side. But every year and a half, you can go back and look at what it did then and pull your descriptions forward. But then there's Mercury. And I believe Dave Lane told me when I first took over the counter that Mercury will make you want to drink. <laughs> and he's not kidding. Especially Trying to write descriptions for where Mercury is going to be for the next 12 months is a real pain in the butt. I imagine uh, uh, Paul doing it for both the calendar and the handbook month by month, left hand no. at the same time. It, no. Uh, it's a, it's really hard to make very concise, accurate descriptions. And I know, I think uh, Roy Bishop's listening in the background. He knows exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, you know, it orbits every 88 days. So, you know, it's going, I mean, you could have one month where it's not visible. It's just too low in the, low in the east in, in, in the morning. And then it's too low in the west in the evening. So you can't see it. And then the next month, the first week of the month, it's visible in the morning. And the end of the month is visible with difficulty in the evening or vice versa or whatever it may be. Um, so you're trying to write all this description to suit what Mercury's doing on one line. You got 200 characters. And the other thing you may have come across, I know I certainly did with the, with, uh, the calendar when I was editor, is you know, you'll make some comment like Venus not observable this month. And then right. lo and behold, someone will contact you and say, yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah, sure, it's visible, but it's in broad daylight. It's, you know, it's... Yeah, well, I, I have a very hard time putting in that Mercury is not observable this month because um, Kurt Nason up in St. John, New Brunswick has a ongoing record. I think he went, I don't know if he still has it, but uh, as of a couple of years ago, he had gone four and a half or five years not missing an operation of Mercury. He, he seeks out a good enough horizon with his telescope of binoculars, every operation to see Mercury. Mm. So there's no operation that's not visible for that man. And, By the way, I just found a typo on your screen. They might have got caught. This was this was the the pre-calendar list, so it may have got caught on the calendar. <laughs> Wait, later is spelled wrong. <laughs> I'm hoping it got caught in the calendar. <laughs> All right, so that's the the just the that. Um, to close that one and i think the only other thing i want to talk about was the photos um and i have i thought i had a powerpoint open here but i don't see it i'm going to stop the share one more time here and i'm going to see if i can find my powerpoint uh, nope. yes the error was caught paul sorry the error was caught was That's it thank you later. it is corrected thank you very much <laughs> Uh, all right, I'm going to just bear with me a second here and find my 
little PowerPoint that I created for this presentation. That's it. Nope, that's the that's the one for the montage calendar images. Nope, used images. Where the heck did it go? 2021 calendar. Oh, there it is. Open my PowerPoint. And I'm going to start my share one last time here. So, depending on the year, the amount of images we get varies. Um, PowerPoint, share. I think I have these on on a timer. So this will go fairly quick. It'll only be another few minutes here. Uh, go slideshow. And slideshow from the beginning. Uh, I get typically 100 to 150 images submitted every year. And on the odd year, I get about a handful of people asking me why images weren't, uh, weren't good enough. Actually, I'm going to stop this for just a second. I'm going to get rid of the, get rid of the timers. Uh, animations, oh, automatic, from the beginning. So I, I get the odd question of why an image didn't quite make the cut, or, or what do I need to do to get my images good enough to make the cut? Um, you know, you look at the calendar, the images for the most part are pretty, pretty darn good. And you should see now a picture of M13, I believe. I believe that's M13. Globular clusters on the screen. Is the slideshow working? Okay, great. Um, sometimes I'm really critical of star images. This one has a lot of halos around them, but also M13 is not that big. You got to remember, um, most cameras are at the resolution of what we need for the calendar. The calendar is a fairly large page. So when you're trying to fill that page uh, with your 300 dot per inch print, you need about 3000 pixels by 2800. It's actually like 3200 pixels by 3,080 pixels in dimension that we need on a TIFF image to get the print quality at the printer. So if your camera is only 4,000 by 3,000 pixels, I almost need your entire frame to, to get the quality I need at the printer on, on, the, on the machines to give us a decent quality paper image. So in this case, for this, this picture, for example, it's quite nice. The halos are a little off, but the biggest thing is, is M13 is only about one fifth, one sixth of the size of the page. It doesn't really fill the page. Scale is one of the biggest problems with a lot of images. Same goes here. Messier one, the uh, the, uh, the uh, crab. This is a great picture of the crab. I love it. I love the colors. I love the detail. Uh, unfortunately, it's so small. If you put that up on a on a page to display on the wall. It's a tiny object. You're not filling the page. You really want to, if you're purposely imaging an object for the calendar, I would say make sure you select an object that with your telescope camera combination, the image scale is such that the object fills three quarters of your frame. Make it so that we, we you know, the picture is the object, not a bunch of space. Same here, another beautiful shot of, uh, I believe this is M78. No, not M78. Uh, it's the M6. little dumbbell. Um, 76? Yeah, 76. Great shot of the little dumbbell. I mean, there's a lot of detail in there, but I can't blow that up anymore to fill the page on the calendar. Uh, that's the way it would appear on the wall. And it's just not enough oomph to, to give you that that jaw dropping. Oh, wow, that's pretty, right? You know, when you open a page or flip a page, you want something spectacular. Um, love this. I love the idea. It's, you know, if you can see it, it's Mercury through an operation. There it is doing its arc, through an operation. Really nice, real nice idea. But again, if you put this on the page and put it on the wall, is it really going to make you go, wow? I mean, the science behind it, understanding what you're seeing is neat. And sometimes I'll put a picture in a calendar because of what you're seeing and what's in it. But in this case, it's just not enough spectacular of an image to really make you want to have to include it. Uh, the veil. I get probably a half dozen shots of the veil every year. Uh, if you look back through past calendars, and I used the veil last year, it's probably not going to get picked this year. Uh, that's other one of the other rules of thumbs that I put in the uh, notes that I send out when I do a call for images, is I like to not use the same object more than once every three years. So 
take a note of what's in the past issues and uh, hold off if you have that really good object. Or if you think, you know, this is good, but you had it last year, send it to me and say, hey, keep this in mind for a year or two from now. Uh, but the other thing is framing. This is a pretty decent image of the veil, but it's not framed nicely. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the bottom corner, but the top end you're cutting off, you know, some of the best part of the, the right hand of the, the, the witch's broom. Landscape shots. There's a lot of good landscape pictures out there. I get a lot of good of uh, foreground objects, neat objects, things, neat things going on here. We've got two planets of the moon within the big eye in, in, uh, over in London in the UK. But there's two things wrong. Uh, it probably could have been framed a little better. And, uh, you can see more of the eye and back up a little bit and still frame things nicely. But the biggest thing is it's in portrait mode counters a landscape mode. I can't change that. So, you know, anything, you know, I get some beautiful northern light shots every year for the last nine years. I've gotten amazing northern light pictures uh, in portrait mode, but I can't put a portrait mode image on the calendar because I can't fill the plate with it. There's also internal reflection on that one, is there not? There, there are some reflections, but I'm not, you know, depending on what the reflections are, I'm not overly upset with them. Like if, if it's, if it doesn't take away from the image, I'm okay with that. Um, but if it, if it adds to it, it'd be okay. Um, decent eclipse of the moon shot, except uh, the image scale was such that they couldn't capture the entire object in, in the view. So it, it's not going to happen. It, like it's it's not going to get included because if you got this this picture of the moon from an eclipse, I probably have a dozen others. And uh, if they're framed better, then that's why they're going to be selected. A uh, spectacular shot of the Orion Nebula, right? Except it's a little over-processed. Um, today's processing software, you can overdo things a little bit with some of the algorithms and different things. Uh, in this case, this one was just a little overdone. It, it just doesn't have that natural look. There, there, there's the point at which things go from wild to uh, something just doesn't look right. Like, like it just doesn't look natural. Um, and, and it's not obvious when you're looking at the one picture, but if I was to put this picture beside the picture that made the calendar uh, one year ago, then it's, you can see it. You can see why the difference is there. Again, image scale, um, you know, it's a, a lot of it's about image scale. Um, here's another one. Clusters, I've only think ever once put a star cluster in the calendar. No, twice, sorry, twice I put clusters in. Uh, but they gotta be spectacular images. In this case, here's a case where you got a nice little cluster, but again, it's, it's your choice of cluster would have to be one that's gotta be very rich or very large enough to fill the frame to be quite spectacular. I do love the star colors in here. I love that there's the oranges, but when you compare it to a cluster like this, that's a little larger and a little more spectacular, you'd say, yeah, this is great. I think this is really nice, except it's way underexposed. There's a lot of noise in the background. It's not smooth. If I was to print this, all that green and cyan, or the cyan and the, the magenta noise in the background would show up on the plate. Um, so this picture with a lot more exposure and a little better processing, no problem. I'd love to put the owl cluster or the ET cluster in if it's framed properly and, and scaled nicely like that. Uh, again, image scale. Some objects up there are really interesting to look at, and they're really neat to see. Marquinian's chain in the Virgo cluster. The, um, love this area of sky, but again, image scale. It's 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 a neat. It, it's neat to see so many galaxies together, but your image scale is such that there's not really much detail going on here. The detail that is there, especially in the eyes, this this cluster and this guy, uh, is so small that it's not you can't see a lot. Um, the eyes, this pair. Of galaxies are known as the eyes. They're actually quite cool and uh, great for observing. Years ago, Rajiv did put pictures like this in the calendar when he was doing the counters black and white. He was shooting a four by five uh, hyper uh, tech pan black and white film. Uh, but the detail in his galaxies was superb. And the real spectacular thing about it, uh, that picture, and I've used other pictures, you can use those images as finder charts. This is a great finder chart for going through this part of the Virgo cluster. It's, it's to scale, you know, the galaxies there, what you can see on them is there. It gives you, it's a really great finder chart. All the stars you see here are probably visible in a 10 inch or 12 inch tall daub. Um, so it's really neat. But again, it's not quite. 
again, here's a pretty good shot of NGC 7331, uh, the Deerwick cluster with, with the, uh, the galaxy. The scale's not quite there. Um, this was done with a CCD camera, and the image scale is such with this camera that I could not actually make this fit the plate on the, on the uh, calendar. So it's nice, but it just would not fit the calendar sized um, print. This one is, it's nicely detailed. But again, this is one of those cases where things are just a little overprocessed. If you look at the background sky, the background sky has a lot of modeling to it. Um, and it's not the integrated flux uh, in the background. It's just the, the overdoing with some of the, uh, some of the processing algorithms. Just too bad, it's, uh, it's really nice. And just for note, um, all these pictures, I did not put anyone's names on them, and none of these pictures are from members in our center. So nobody has to worry that I'm going to critique our photos. Uh, these are all from other members across the country. Um, aurora shots, uh, landscape auroras are great. This is kind of pretty, except, um, you know, the, the cloud, the aurora is quite low. It's not quite prominent. You got to remember, if there's good auroras out there, and I'm getting one or two shots like this, I'm probably getting a handful of other aurora shots. And um, if it's not filling the filling the sky, you know, if, if it's an aurora that's just low, but if it's an aurora that's filling the sky, filling the image, uh, to really give it that oof uh, is what it is. There are some pictures sent to me. The minute I get them, it's like that's going to be in the calendar. Uh, you, you just know the minute you see it. This is a nice image. I love, the, the, you know, the, the contrast and the, the brightness. But again, it's overprocessed. It's really pixelated. Um, the noise is, it was really, it, st it was stretched a lot and it would stretch too much for the data so that you get that graininess to it. it just, uh, when you print that at a 11 by 14, it's just not going to cut it. So that's an example of pictures that don't make the calendar and some of the reasons why. And I have gone back to finish off here. I've gone back through my 10 years and I picked out 15 pictures from nine years worth of calendars uh, that are the favorite of mine for those nine years. And some of these are for local. Uh, Barry Burgess locally here the, the, down the South Shore, um, just the southern Milky Way from Nova Scotia. Unbelievable uh, to, to be able to see that kind of thing here. Love, love the shot. Out west, Northern Lights, I mentioned how it's got a field of view and this is one of those cases where it's filling the view. You're seeing the Northern Lights up and you're getting the feeling that you're completely engrossed in it. And of course, then you have the reflection off the ice, much like the other picture that had the reflection off the, uh, the lake and ice. Here we have it as well. Um, one of my favorites. Yeah. Alan's eclipse photo. What can I say? Anybody who saw the eclipse, this this is it, right? This is this takes you back there, and, and that's what it did. This took me back to those three and a half hours of eclipse, um, both the partial phases, the diamond ring, the, uh, the corona, just unbelievable. Uh, the platies with the uh, flux nebula all around them. Here you got all this real dust out here and fur areas plus everything in the middle. Uh, just spectacular image. The, the depth that this went into uh, is, is unbelievable. Again, this is one of those pictures. The minute I see it, it's like, yeah, that's going in the calendar. Sure, the platies aren't filling the entire view, but there's so much real other stuff going on here that's just unbelievable. I mentioned landscape shots that sometimes don't always have the sky stuff that's that's perfect, but there's just something else about it that's going on. And this was one of those ones that I was just like, gee, there's, there's so much happening here um, science-wise. Uh, we, we have the night sky with the Milky Way uh, down here. You know, you have a little bit of hint of the, 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 the dancing, the prancing horse. But you got the central bulge of the Milky Way. You do have that coming up. you got this nice meteor coming down through the image. You have a rainbow. Sorry, you have a moon bow. This is a moon bow. So you have the physics of, of the moon light shining through the Earth's atmosphere and through the water droplets that are being cast by the mist from the geysers. And then you have the whole geology going on here that causes geysers. Like, this is space to, to Earth and in between physics on so many different levels. Um, Where was that taken, do you know, Paul? Uh, that was in Yellowstone by uh, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer West from the Winnipeg Center. Yeah. It's just one of those shots that you're like, yeah, uh, there's probably better uh, astral photos in my collection, but there's just so much happening here um, that you can look at and say, wow, like, you know, like that's a really amazing shot to capture all that in one go. And that was one frame, which is truly amazing. 
uh, Kevin Black did this year's uh, horse head. That's actually in, I believe, the January image this year. Uh, truly an amazing the amount of depth he got in that image and the contrast, uh, not to mention the colors. Uh, truly beautiful shot. I, I typically get two or three horse heads per year, and uh, I've used it, I think, four years ago. So this year was the year to go back to it, and, and this is the one that made it. Uh, <laughs> summer Milky Way from down under when it's high overhead. Um, just just phenomenal. There's been some truly amazing photos over the years. Deborah Cervolo's uh, Lagoon shot from several years ago. This was in 13 or 14. Um, the dark nebulas and the, the, uh, the Bach globules that are in here, the star cluster, the pinks of the, of the lagoon, um, the dark comet, Bernard's dark comet is in here as well. There's, there's just so much going on in this photo, the, so much depth and, and so much true to the color of the actual object. Really amazing. The Hamburger Galaxy, again, scale, scale, scale. Here we have a galaxy shot with a telescope and a camera uh, so that we have it basically fill in the frame. You can, you can see the detail in the object itself, but it fills your view. Truly amazing. This is actually taken with what is now the REC telescope. This was back taken back before we purchased it. So this gives you an idea of what that scope is capable of. It's Paul Mortfields. This is local. Uh, Kathy. Kathy's online, I believe. This is hers, Kathy Walker. Truly, uh, this was the winning photo from Nova East a couple of years ago. Um, just amazing. Again, it's M13. I, I showed you an M13 earlier where it was about a quarter the size of that. But it's so much more um, just in your face, like boom, there. And, and that's what really... And uh, what really made Kathy's photo spectacular about this was was the uh, the sharpness, the, those pinpoint stars, the, the amazing seeing that she had for for the data from this image. Truly good, good shot. Landscape photos don't always have to be of aurora. There's some great star trails that can be done out there. You just need the right target. Here's one uh, outside of Ottawa, the Radio Observatory in Ontario. Um, again, you know, it's just one of those photos you get, and it's like. You know, it's a great star trail shot just with the star trails alone, but to do it in front of a, a radio observatory dish or, or an observatory dome or something just gives it that that touch that this is a real astrophoto. Um, really nice. Not the Lucian clouds from the Yukon. Uh, this is over the, uh, which museum is it? I can't remember the name of the museum in Whitehorse, or sorry, Yellowknife. Yeah, to excuse me on that one, I'm sorry, but again, just a beautiful shot of the NLC clouds reflected in a lake. Um, this was sent to me and I was like, yeah, that's going in the calendar. It's uh, how often do I put an NLC cloud photo in? Very rarely. I think this year, 2020, I included Barry Burgess's uh, photo. 2020? Yeah, 2020 from the Peggy's Cove of the NLC clouds from Nova Scotia, simply because we've never seen them so far south before. So that had some science, but it had the, uh, the lighthouse and spectacular view. But uh, I get a, probably a dozen photos every year of the Orion Nebula complex, uh, as expected. It, it takes something really spectacular on Orion to, to make it into the calendar once every four years. You've you got to have one that's going to really compete. And this is one that shows the entire complex, both everything around it, but right to the core of the, right, right into the core of the running man. You can see all the detail and right into the core of the trapezium. It's, it's, everything's there. Just spectacular. Again, image scale. Uh, I, I probably get one or two shots of the whirlpool every year, where the whirlpool is a quarter of that size or smaller. And there's spectacular images, nice, nice development, you know, nice processing done and stuff, but just too darn small. But when you get an image like this, you can put it on a plate, and, uh, you know, an image plate for the printer, and, and you get spectacular results. And this, this is from this year's Kathy uh, Hepburn's uh, shot of the, uh, the cocoon. Uh, again, it's this particular shot was one. The star images are pinpoints. The saturation is just perfect, so that you get that star color, star color out of the red giants. The blue ones are, are jumping out at you, but those red giants scattered throughout here are, are nice. But really, what impressed me most was how she captured all this dust. And this dust is actually the dark area on most photos of Bernard 168, the dark object that the cocoon is in. 
and here she's turned that dark object into a dusty lane of material, uh, which is, you're, you're going deep when you're going into getting that. So that's what really made this cocoon stand out over other cocoons in the past. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm going to stop the share here, and I'm going to mention some of the other resources I do have. One other thing I do get, and I check all my data against, is every year I get copies of these, the Astronomical Phenomena for 2019, 2020. Um, these are produced by the U.S. Naval Observatory. I make copies out of them um, on the on eight and a half by 11s, and uh, I go through these, and they have all your calendar dates, all your religious calendar, civic calendar uh, for the U.S. and the United Kingdom and stuff. So I go through and I manually take those and input them into my spreadsheet. Phases of the moon, there's a whole list in here of those. I verify that against our data that we have put out. And then there's the apogees and the perigees are here. All the elongations are here for the planets. And then, then they have about seven pages of month by month of events. And these are what's all spit out through the software that Dave and Alistair provided me. But I go through this book and highlight event by event with what's in my spreadsheet to make sure what's in here is in mine and what is in mine matches what's in theirs, day to day, spacing to spacing, just to make sure that we're pretty much in line with the U.S. Naval Observatory's stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it takes to put the calendar together. And as Judy said, I'm about to begin year 10, uh, which is year last. Uh, uh, 10 is a decade, and that's a nice round number. And it's a nice time to stop production on, on uh, something that takes up a fair bit of my time from pretty much Christmas uh, through till, I would say, May when the image selection is done. And then I take a break through May and June. And it's normally the end of June, 1st of July, that my God will start sending me proofs. And my summer, I normally four to six weeks of proofreading and checking back and forth with Mike and James Edgar. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting some of that free time back to to do my stuff. In the winter time, I'm looking to have my computer not doing uh, calendar work, but have my computer doing imaging work back in the observatory and actually getting back down there and start observing more, which I did this fall as well. So I'm looking for a replacement. <laughs> so I, I guess this is kind of a shopping uh talk as well just to let people know what's involved and uh, how the calendar is done and i'm i'm looking for an assistant editor for 2022 and uh, with the intent that whoever would be my assistant for the 2022 calendar could come on and take over with the 2023 calendar and um, be the editor and i would stick around as an assistant for that one year to help out and then after that i'd be done <laughs> so that's it. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, You're welcome. That, that's quite phenomenal. And um, obviously, you've been bored for the last 10 years to be able to do all that work. <laughs> well, on top of everything else, uh, the cadets, uh, for the last three years, I've been volunteering with the, the cadet uh, squadron here at, uh, at uh, CFB Greenwood. Um, I'm actually a civilian instructor now, not a civilian volunteer. And my paperwork is in progress where I'm waiting to get the call to be sworn in. And I will be becoming an officer cadet in the CIC and uh, going on to be an officer in the third branch of the armed forces as a CIC officer. So that's that's where my volunteer hours are going to be going when the calendar is done, because I'll be back into the cadet system as an officer. Well, we truly appreciate what you have done. I mean, the calendar adorns our wall and it's constantly referenced. Um, it, it, it is a lot of fun, and I must say, I, one thing I didn't mention is that the most fun or the best part of the calendar is picking images. It, it's really fun getting 150 pictures to go through and seeing the amazing work that people are doing across this country. I don't envy you that job, though, going through 150 and, and deciding what 12 or 13, actually, I guess, when you consider the cover, uh, get cho get chosen. Um, the challenge must be there. Is it only you that, by the way, that decides what pictures get chosen, or is this sort of your recommendation and the others agree? No, nope, photos are up to me. That's the one thing the editor can hold close to their heart. Photos uh, are up to them. <laughs> the only time I, I'll, uh, I'll often pick 14. We use 12, 
and we use the one as the count as the cover from inside. So I'll pick 14 with the chance that one of the 12 might not quite make the cut at print. Um, and that has happened twice where we get close to print and um, an image just didn't quite cut it. It's, uh, the quality wasn't there when it went to the proof. Right. I had a Venus transit image uh, where, where it was an image of the Venus transit in H alpha uh, of the sun. And it was spectacular, except it was on such a small image scale or the, the camera had such a small pixel resolution, it just could not really be blown up to the extent we wanted to fill a decent portion of the page. Okay. Any other questions for Paul before we go on to the next presentation? Uh, well, a question and a comment. Um, I was lucky when Dave was editor of the calendar that I didn't have to go through a selection process for handbook covers. He would pick them for the calendar, give me all the ones he didn't want. And fortunately, most of those, because the handbook is portrait, a lot of the ones that he couldn't use because they were in the wrong orientation, I was able to use. And it's funny, I, when you call somebody up and say, you submitted a picture for the RAC calendar, uh, they can't use it. What would you mind if I put it on the cover of the handbook for the next year? Everybody agreed to it for some strange. I'm sure they would. <laughs> I doubt anybody <laughs> would disagree with that. Actually, uh, me and James have kind of gotten to a battle over uh, getting cover photos. Um, the cover photo of the handbook, he beat me to Deborah this year by a day uh, requesting <laughs> that picture. So she's like, sorry, I can't give it to you for the counter. James is going to use it on the, on the handbook. I'm like, that bugger. <laughs> so we, we, we've, we've done that a couple of times in the last three years where we fought over, over an image for, for one or the other. Uh, the question I had, though, was because uh, I, I do the Blum Natural Society's natural history calendar, and it takes us a long time to pick the pictures because we try to match the subject to each of the months. Do you consciously make a decision that like, if you're going to use an Orion thing, you're not going to put it in July or August, you're going to sort of put the things in at the time of year to see them? I, I do. I, I try to put uh, any of the shots that have the Southern Milky Way or landscape photos like Jason's photo of, of Scorpius and, and Sagittarius. I try to put those somewhere in the summer months. I do try to put anything Orion, Horsehead, stuff like that somewhere in the winter months. If it's, oh. a, lo if it's a lunar shot, I try to tie it to something on the moon, something that's going on. Like there was one year we had a had a first quarter shot or something that had the X in it or something. So I put it in March, try to get it to the time of year when, when, when or, or, or it was a month that the X was visible or something like that. Um, so I do try to tie things seasonally at least so that, yeah. you know, you can see that this, this time of year. Yeah, good. It's kind of an afterthought, really. I don't, I don't select pictures on that basis. I select the pictures and then I try to make them fit. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Paul, for that. Well, thank you. It's been fun. It, um, I mean, the product is beautiful and it's obviously not as simple as it looks to put it together. Um, well, thank you for <laughs> telling us how that's done. We'll have a great appreciation for the calendar. Um, and I'll put a plug in for it. Uh, we still have lots of copies of the calendar. If anybody would like one, um, just let us know. Uh, how to acquire one is, is on our website. You can transfer the monies to our treasurer and he will uh, send the calendar out accordingly. But we'll get into that again later. But thank you so much. I yes, got one more plug, Judy. Yeah. Um, one of the other perks of editors, you get your own box of calendars. Yeah. Um, but with that box, you send out the calendars to all your contributors. So every uh, image contributor and every volunteer proofreader, uh, I send them a couple calendars each out of that box. And then you have probably half a dozen to a dozen left over that you can hand out to your friends to do what you want with. Uh, have one at home, one, at office, one in your kid's room. Um, so, so you do get to do that. Um, and it's nice because you get to send those out and uh, talk to each of the contributors and thank them for it. So it's uh, just a perk. And when do we get those, Paul? Uh, Dave, I normally give you yours at your Christmas party, but wow. <laughs> we'll have to figure that one out. I mailed everyone else's, but I held yours just in case we were in the neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be in touch. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you again. Uh, we'll move on now, and it's our other Paul, our Paul Heath, who is our uh, outreach chair, and Paul is going to do a youth, show us one of his youth presentations, and, and I believe it, it's about critters from other worlds, right, Paul? Uh, 
Well, sort of. It's the idea that there might be something out there and uh, let the kids try to figure it out for themselves. So it's, uh, um, it, I usually start with uh, uh, slides, just a quick overview of slides. I'm going to try to see if I can figure out how to hook this up. Uh, share screen. Okay. All right. Is, is anything showing up? Oh. Not yet. All right. There. There it is. Yep. Okay. There it is. So there's there's my presentation startup. Uh, is anyone out there? So we to go from there, we uh, usually start with a real alien. That was the uh, World Wildlife Fund that uh, Quinn and I did downtown a few years back. But then um, a little bit of things like from Carl Sagan. Uh, we're in a position in the time where we can actually search for uh, planets around other stars and possible life. And if I, I'll just slide down here. And at the moment, we've got some candidates of possible life. These are different planets that uh, may, may have, we know have atmospheres and may have life. But what kind of life? So we need to, we need to look at that. And um, I usually try to... Uh, where am I at here? I got my slides. Uh, try to go on the different uh, planetary types. We have gaseous, rocky, water planets, uh, maybe frozen ice worlds. Uh, worlds will have different sizes, will have different gravity. So how does it affect the body? How would the body be affected by the, the, the size of the planet? So less stress on a body for a low gravity, greater stress on a body for higher but what is what does that mean well we want to look at different uh atmospheric conditions uh how does sound travel uh how does it affect vision uh the clarity of vision with the thin atmosphere but the air is less breathable so technically maybe the lungs would have to be larger or a, a different type of different type of uh way to breathe and then we review what we have on this planet because we have such a diversity. Uh, if it was a water planet, which ours is generally a water planet, different types of life. So we could have crawling on the bottom, swimming free, uh, floating, and rapid, rapid motion, streamlined. If it was a rocky planet, which ours is also a rocky planet, if it was low gravity, maybe stilts, thin, thin body, thin legs, thin arms, wings, or if it was a heavy planet, solid legs, short and tall. So we look at the possible varieties uh, of aliens. And of course, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the movie theaters have come up with a number of different uh, uh, types of aliens for us to sort of look at. And what I would do here, okay, where would this alien be come from? We'd look at the, at the features, large eyes, gills, where would you think this planet, an alien with those features might come from? So you would look at a possibility of a, of a water world with uh, thick, thick skull and, and uh, reinforced uh, bone structure, maybe a heavy planet. So we, we, we can look at the different aliens of where they might, uh, might come from. And from there, I would uh, go to, uh, so basically what I have here is I have a, an assortment of bodies, uh, large heavy bodies, small heavy bodies. So like the tortoise and the elephant, uh, jellyfish, a big fog ball, uh, small, small animals uh, in, with light gravity. And we have various eyes and ears that they can choose from. Uh, maybe large eyes if they're in areas with uh, uh, Thin atmosphere where they need need to be able to see the distance, uh, breathing, different types of noses, beaks, mouths, big feet, long long legs that are thick, long legs that are thin, short thick legs, maybe like a centipede uh, legs, or even even if it's a water world, tentacles, or short wings and arms for ones that might fly, gills different size heads. Uh, down here, we could have a large head on the, on the elephant, 
or we could make it just a small hit on the large body, whichever way the child wants to put it. Uh, they might have big ears on on the small body to hear if the if uh, sound didn't travel very far. Uh, the eyes could be just small ones. And I've had a few times where it's like a bird, so it's got a big beak. I got to make a smaller beak for some of the some of the characters. But the idea is that they would choose what the what the alien would look like based on whether or not you had different characters, whether it was a rocky planet, a water planet, uh, whether or not uh, they had uh, uh, um, thin atmosphere, thick light gravity. Uh, we could make a an, um, a creature that floated that had almost like uh, eyes on stalks, um, an anteater type beak, and possibly wings because if a low at, low uh, gravity, they might be able to fly. It would be up to the child, but the the idea is to make them look at what are the parameters of the of the planet. Or is it as a big planet, as a gas giant, is it a water planet? Uh, what is the possibility uh, of, of life? What would life maybe look like? And it's a fun exercise and it's a great, great way to stretch your imaginations, yet at the same time, they're incorporating scientific fact. Because when we look at planets around other star systems, we're trying to find out um, uh, what, what would we find there? And we know from various things, life is ubiquitous. <clears throat> we found them on lava, bacteria on lava, at the black smokers at the bottom of oceans. We found them deep in bacteria, deep in the ice, ice caps. And we have life all through the water column in the oceans. We have life that flies through the air, uh, all through the jungles, the deserts. So we we on our own world, we know that life can exist in so many different varieties of, of environments. And now that we're able to find planets around other stars, we need to start looking at what will that life look like? It may not be what the, the movie theaters tell us it is. Maybe something totally different, but at least we're thinking, and we might recognize if something sort of flies into our view, we might know, oh, that comes from that kind of planet. So the, the idea is to have fun with this um, and to get the kids to think about the science behind the aliens they see on TV. Like, where would that alien come from? What kind of planet would that alien be from? And uh, get them to, to look at it and possibly start looking thick or more into the science of what makes us look the way we are. Like, why do we have arms and legs? And why is our head like this and our eyes and our ears? So that they can look at the, the various environments that the, the animals look in or live in and project that into what we see out in space. So hopefully we could have a, a, a fun time at this. And, uh, and like I said, I've got to make small, smaller beaks <laughs> and uh, I got to do, I, I've got legs, but I forgot to make feet. So I've got to make some felt for feet, different kinds of claws and, and whatever, flippers or whatever, but you can use your imagination and uh, at a camp, you can get the kids to cut out their own, like out of felt, because it's basically it's felt and, uh, you uh, just cut it to the shape you want and use a black felt board and the felt sticks to the felt really well. So it's something that can be folded up and taken and I can easily quickly open it up and we can have fun trying to figure out what all these creatures are that we're, we're looking at. So it's just, a, it's a fun program. It takes a little bit of work to get it ready, but uh, most of the time I've had it, the kids really enjoyed it, have fun. And even with adults in the libraries, when I did library talks, they really enjoyed, enjoyed it. So it's a fun exercise and you can get some weird creatures. <laughs> so but that's, that's sort of my project for today. Any questions for Paul? Thanks, Paul. I can just no. imagine a, a kid of almost any age having a lot of fun with that. Even if they don't fully understand the science behind it, they'd still have fun creating these critters. Yeah, 
but I, but my, my goal has always been to let's look at the science. Let, let's look at what the different types of planets look like. And then we've got examples from all over our earth of what creatures might look like in different environments. We know we've got four or five different body types that live in an ocean. We've got four or five different body types that live on land and, and can fly and not fly. So there's lots of, of visuals that they could use to, to give them ideas of what right. might be in that, uh, that planet. So just a fun, fun exercise and uh, you just let your mind stretch and your imagination go. Well, thanks so much for that. That's cool. Thanks. Something for folks to think about if they're ever doing some outreach to a youth groups, certainly. Okay. <coughs> Could you stop your screen share, please, Paul? Oh, I thought I did. Oh, maybe you did, sir. Uh, yeah, I thought yeah, I did. you did. My apologies. Yes, it's me that's got to go to screen share at this point. <laughs> Next on the agenda is the um, updates from the board. It's very brief this month, relatively relative to other months. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the perks of joining because everyone here today is in fact a member of RASC, Halifax Center. Um, you certainly know how to reach us and, and the uh, uh, website address. But I do want to reinforce Paul's promotion of the calendar and certainly the Explore the Universe, which is, I know you get as a member, but if you need any additional copies, they are available. And hopefully by now, you will have received the Observer's Handbook 2021. Just as an explanatory note, um, it had been delayed from National. Apparently their uh, shipper, the people that ship out the Observer's Handbook, we're in the process of moving, did not inform National and had paused all their shipping so that that's why they were late. It wasn't until RAS contacted them and said, you were supposed to get these out and you better have them done by a certain date, which they did. So hopefully you've received it by now or will be shortly if you haven't already. And yes, there's that wonderful photo that um, James beat you to, Paul. So the RAS calendars, we already know about those and how you can get them. Basically, we want you to put in your um, send an e-transfer to the treasurer at that email address with your name and a mailing address and it will be sent to you ASAP, thanks to the works between Greg Dill as the treasurer and Wayne Harasimovich as our postmaster for this particular item. I want to uh, give a special thanks to our St. Croix Observatory Fundraising Committee, Blair McDonald as its chair, along with Matt Dyer and Greg Dill, and myself as an ex officio capacity. Halifax Center has some incredible astro imagers, as you're very much aware. And three of them, Blair McDonald, Jerry Black, and Jason Dane, have donated 16 photos for us to choose from. There were 10 deep sky and six wide field. And you can order an eight by 10 color print of any one of these photos. Would you like a copy or would you like to send it as a gift either for the holiday season or perhaps a little later for as a birthday or an anniversary gift to someone special? Any sort of uh, reason for doing so. They're $30. That includes printing, shipping, and everything else included. And you can get them very simply. You can view all the photos and, and find out how to order by going to our website at healthax.rask.ca and on the home page in the center column called Quick Info, is the item on the SCO Astro uh, Photo Fundraising. Just click on it, it'll bring you right to the page and show you everything you need to know about uh, acquiring one of these. Blair, did you want to add anything to this at this point? Uh, no, I think you've pretty much covered it, uh, covered everything I was going to uh, mention. Uh, as you said, there's a link right off the sort of center panel of our webpage and uh, folks can go there, pick their favorite photo and basically order them online with just um, uh, an internet, ah, sorry, an interact transfer to our treasurer and we will happily get them in the mail and off to you. That's right. Or you can arrange for pickup and that, how to do that is also out on the site on the page about the extra photo fundraising. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. One thing, one thing we should mention, Judy, the astrophoto fundraising is, uh, 
to raise additional funds for the uh, electrification and upkeep of St. Croix. Right, so that the these will be available, uh, although we said our fundraising for the donations from members was uh, at the end of December, this will go on into the new year. It will continue past um, December 30, 30, 31st. <laughs> so it'll still be online. And then we come to the fundraising um, with respect to the member donations. I'd like to thank, uh, officially I'll thank Mary Lou Whitehorn for this wonderful cartoon of our um, SCO Observatory uh, site. Um, it, it'd be incredible if we could decorate it like that without obstructing anyone's view. But however, uh, nonetheless, you're probably wondering where do we stand in terms of the amount donated? Well, as of about 11.30 this morning, we've donated, we have $7,885, which means we have now surpassed our funding goal. Are we going to stop? No. <laughs> Donations are, are certainly still welcomed because as Blair said, anything that we raise uh, with this, as well as the astrophoto um, purchase goes towards future scope upgrades and, and whatnot. So that items that we identify need repair or need it being added to the observatory can certainly be funded through this. So thank you everyone that has donated so far. And like I said a moment ago, we are certainly open to additional funds coming in uh, so that we can keep those funds uh, delegated specifically to SCO. They will not go to general coffers for expenditure on other items. So we've done well. It's December 5th and we've reached our goal. Just to let you know where we are, the pole has been installed on site. You can see the wire going across uh, the driveway. It is not interfering at all with our sight lines. It is in the tree line. Uh, so thanks to K-Line Construction and Minus Energy for getting that project to that point. Roy Bishop, myself, and John Lajard were on site talking to the folks from K-Line to discuss where the pole would be located. What we haven't got done at this point is the transformer hadn't been hadn't arrived by the time these uh, this pole was installed. We have to hire an electrician and then we can get the masthead on the warm room installed as well as all the other electrical work that is required to bring us up to 2020 Nova Scotia electrical code. Okay, but in any case, that's what it'll look like. The masthead, uh, if you, uh, can you see my pointer here on the screen? Okay, this tree here, that's the general area on the side of the warm room that you will have the masthead. So again, it won't be visible above the tree line. Observing certificates. Uh, there were two since the last meeting that we had. One to Karen Hamblin. Congratulations, Karen, on receiving your Explore the Universe, as well as Troy Sweeney, who Dave Chapman mentioned earlier. So congratulations to you both on that achievement. And there was one more as of uh, the earlier in November, on the 20th of November. Tony Shellen, congratulations on your um, NGC, finest uh, NGC objects. He did all 101, not only did he observe them, but he also sketched them all too. So congratulations, Tony, well done. Also like to point out Halifax Center stars. These are folks that got their photos or received some other recognition outside of our center itself. RASC has agreed to or decided that the winners of the RASC Astro Imaging Certificates will be featured on the banner of the RASC Weekly. And I mentioned last month that our first one was Blair McDonald. Well, we have a second one. The following week on November the 9th, it was Moon and Maple by Art Cole. So congratulations, Art, for his photo up on the masthead. And as well, it's another recognition that needs to be made is congratulations, John McPhee, for being first place in the sunset, sunrise, and night sky category in the Friends of Kedgy photo contest. Beautiful photo uh, of the Milky Way reflected on that water on Kedge Lake. So congratulations. 
from national RASC. RASC, you can now say, doesn't have 29 centers anymore. It has 30. Abbotsford, BC was recently joined in the family of centers across the country. The robotic telescope data is now available for purchase. And you can go onto the RASC website to find out how to do this. Um, but for this year only, RASC is releasing two years worth of data for the price of one. Adults pay only $100 and students receive a $50 discount. And you can go online and find out what that entails, what you get for the, those monies. And also, as of November 27th, there were two RASC members appointed to the Order of Canada. One was Dr. Peebles, who's an honorary member. He received the Companion of the Order of Canada. And Dr. Sarah Sager from Toronto Centre, who also was a speaker here, I uh, believe it, on one of the national um, speaker presentations. She is now an officer of the Order of Canada. So congratulations to them both as well. Judy, this is Dave Chapman. Um, Sarah Seeger is also an honorary member of the RASC. Was she? Okay. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they only cited her as Toronto Centre. Of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dave. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I picked up the new uh, calendar or the new Sky News arrived. I have a whole box of these and the last uh, calendar edition. I'm not sure with COVID how we're, because we used to hand them out at the meetings for new members or visitors and that. So I'm just wondering if anybody, uh, what what they would, sort of the idea of what to do with them uh, so far as, because uh, they're basically for uh, outreach and, and other events, which we're not having that much of. So. Well, hopefully by the spring that can be rectified, yeah. so. Okay. I'm just saying if, if I've got a box of each of them, if anyone's looking for a, a Christmas gift <laughs> to, to a friend. Um, I, I like to update today. Uh, I, I, some of you may have seen the email from uh, Rod Thacker about the donation from Steve uh, in the Valley uh, or in Churro. Uh, of, it's an older Celestion, uh, eight inch Celestion. And um, I inquired about it for the um, let's grow with us uh, let's grow together group in uh, East Preston uh, we've been working with them to develop an astronomy program for the youth and their age from four to 21 years of age and we picked that up today and um, some of you remember that we received a similar telescope a few years back that was missing a few parts in that so uh, I've also given that to the the, uh, the youth group and we're gonna look at, compare the one that works and what's to find the parts we're missing. We're also, we're, we're looking right now for a, at the very least a 10 by 10 pad to set the telescopes up at their campsite in East Preston. They've got a large open field and that, and uh, we've got two of the directors at the moment are working on the Explore the Universe program. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get their astronomy program up and running real soon and we'll have, two good telescopes for them to use. And they've already got a handfuls of binoculars for the kids to use as well. So it should be a good start to uh, get some young people involved with astronomy. That's great, Paul. That was my outreach report. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that brings us to the next portion of the program, which is Dave Chapman and what's up for December. So, so, so Dave, I will hand it off to you, please. Yeah, well, I had to scramble there because I thought I was doing it for November and then you changed it on me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, all right. So what's up for December? Uh, actually a fair bit going on, as you might imagine. Uh, I'd just like to remind you that this is made with the RSC Observer's Handbook and Sky Safari. Graphics come where they come from Sky Safari. So this is the last one of 2020, and I, I will continue into the new year, 2021, and do another round. I'm thinking that I might uh, step down at the end of that year and let someone else be observing chair, and uh, I'll probably be talking to people along the way. But I just wanted to say before we go there is that a lot of the stuff that shows up in the WhatsApp, uh, I now have a full year's worth of uh, graphics that don't change very much. 
Uh, and so um, I will have like the materials for someone to carry on afterwards. So that picture that was on the title uh, is my picture uh, that was taken with uh, my uh, camera and my 14 millimeter Rokinon lens that I bought several years ago. So it has uh, Orion and the Winter Milky Way and a few other prominent stars. So that picture was taken uh, particularly to be able to capture the six um, points of the winter hexagon. So you're starting at the bottom left, you got Sirius going to Rigel, up to Aldebaran, uh, up to Capella, over to Castor and Pollux, which I think of as just one corner, uh, and then Procyon. I think that's the way you say it, or is it Procyon? Uh, so, and then back to Sirius. So that's the hexagon. And, and then there's the winter triangle, which is Procyon, Procyon Sirius, Betelgeuse, because Betelgeuse got left out of the hexagon. And I actually uh, didn't know about the Winter Triangle before. I think Judy taught me about the Winter Triangle. So thanks, Judy, for pointing that out. I didn't really see that before. It's pretty close to an equilateral triangle. Dave? Yeah? One of the, when I, before I knew about the Winter Circle, I only heard about the, the G, so that there was oh. no line between Capella and Aldebaran. It goes from Capella to the twins, Procyon. Oh, right. Aldebaran and then over to Betelgeuse. That's, all, that's one way to include the Betelgeuse in, in yeah. the... Anyhow, so actually the Procyon is an interesting star. Uh, its name almost literally from the Greek means before the dog. And the reason it's called that is in most parts of the Northern Hemisphere, Procyon actually rises before Sirius does. And, uh, and that's why it has that name, Procyon, before the dog. Sirius is the dog star. No, little astronomy trivia there. And of course, over at the right, we have the Pleiades and the Hyades, uh, two fairly close uh, star clusters to us, which is why they're so spread out and are really more binocular objects than they are telescope objects. So a few other things in that picture, if you want to po poke around. Uh, so, um, So the sun this month, um, the sun has been uh, fairly, fairly active. It's waking up after a long period of dormancy. In the last uh, little while, last week or so, or a couple of weeks or so, there's been a fairly big uh, sunspot group, uh, which is now rotating off the, uh, the limb. We might, you know, it'd be interesting to see if that comes back in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you go online to the REC webpage. This presentation is there. Um, uh, there's a link to it. And if you open the presentation, all the hyperlinks, which are the things with underlines blue, all of those are active. So for instance, if you go and look at this after I finish, you can that up at the upper right, today's solar activity will take you to the page which shows you the sun in all kinds of different wavelengths and give you all the information about what it looks like today. Uh, so December is an interesting month. Of course, it includes the winter solstice, which, which is uh, where the sun, you know, goes stationary it's, uh, in terms of its uh, declination uh, at some point during the month. So, so the change in the circumstances of sunset and so on, it's not that great be between the beginning and the end of the year and end of the month because Nothing is, nothing is changing very quickly. So sunset times are pretty stationary. Dusk end times, the length of darkness and so on, the, the dawn start, uh, sunrise, they're, they're all fairly, um, fairly dormant. You know, they don't change very much, even the maximum altitude. So between now and, uh, you know, um, middle of January, things pretty much don't change a lot. Uh, you won't, it won't really see a difference in the length of the day until about the start of February. That's when you really start to notice that the days are getting longer and so on. Um, so those those pie charts that I've made um, for the first and the 31st, you can see they're quite similar. The only thing that really, the biggest difference between them is the time of solar noon, which uh, I won't go into that, but it, a noon, solar noon isn't at noon. 
And there's a couple of reasons for that. It's in the handbook, of course. Uh, and if you go to our YouTube channel, Rask Halifax, there's a, a full animation of this uh, throughout a year. So you can see how that all changes. It's, it's worth watching. As far as the moon is concerned, um, we're almost upon the last quarter. Moon is a morning object at the moment, and it's still rivers freezing over time. Uh, and again, if you go to the online uh, version of this, you can follow that link and it will take you to the Mi'kmaq Moon site where Curtis Michael will teach you how to say that word. Um, so on the 12th, uh, you will see moon and the, the moon and Venus together if we ever get rid of these darn clouds. Now that's a morning, a morning view. So if you get up, you know, not too early, um, because it stays dark fairly late. You, you should be able to pick that out uh, if you're the kind of person that gets up to go to work and that. Uh, the moon is at perigee and the new moon is a couple of days later. I don't know if anybody bought tickets for the total eclipse in South America. It would have been an expensive trip. I don't know if anyone's going down there, but that is the start of the winter moon or the chief moon. Kezi Gewi Goose or Kiji Goose. Um, that's, uh, that's in the, kind of the middle of the month. Um, I'm going to talk about the, this is the moon page. I'm going to talk about Jupiter and Saturn in a minute, but on the, the night of the 16th into the 17th, uh, the moon, uh, uh, well, both, both nights, the moon isn't far from Jupiter and Saturn. So that, that certainly the 16th. So that might be an interesting photo opportunity for people who like to make nightscapes. Um, and then if you're looking for hints on how to find Neptune, uh, December, on December 20th, Neptune is within a binocular field of the moon. That'll help you find Neptune if you're trying to do that for the Explore the Universe. First quarter is on the December 21st, which is the solstice. That also happens to be the uh, conjunction date. So mark December 21st on your calendar. It's a very important day. Uh, the moon passes Mars on December 23rd. It, Mars is now in the evening sky and shrinking away from us. Uh, I had a really good, you know, people were mentioning how great Mars was and I would echo that. It's the best view I've ever had, period, the, this, uh, this apparition. And uh, who knows, it might be the best one I ever have. Um, then on the New Year, uh, Christmas Eve, uh, if, if you're still in the observing mood, you can look at Moon and Uranus in binoculars. So if you're doing Explore the Universe and you want to find a couple of planets, you can see, you know, you can see Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, and Mars. Uh, the only one that's missing is Mercury, but um, they're, they're fairly easy to find. The full moon is on the 30th of December, and that's the, it's still, of course, the winter moon. And, uh, just before the end of, of this calendar year. Now, as far as the moon is concerned, um, I all, uh, the, this is the uh, moon map that's in Explore the Universe. It's a, a simplified version of the one that's in the handbook. These on, this map only shows the items that are in Explore the Universe, should you want to um, uh, pursue that. I have um, circled the ones that would be easy to see on the first quarter night. So. Um, I don't know why I picked that one. I guess you can just see a lot of things on when it's first quarter. So there's one, two, three, four, Mare, and one, two, three, four, um, craters. So of course, you can see more than that, but uh, th those are the easy ones. But you might be able to see some other things as well. Um, certainly, the other Mare will be visible. So that would be a good night for observing all around if, if it's clear. That's always the kicker. So the planets. Well, Mercury is easy. It's too close to the sun. I don't care what anybody else says. <laughs> for, for, for ordinary folks, it's too close to the sun. Venus is, you know, it's still there in the, evening, in the morning sky, but it's getting lower and closer to the sun. I didn't check, but it must be headed for a, a, a conjunction, a superior conjunction, I'm guessing, uh, coming up. I, I haven't looked into that. Um, Mars, as I said, it's on its way out. It's still quite prominent. It has now become dimmer than Jupiter. And the disk size is about half of what it was in its heyday. Um, see you in 2035. 
Um, Jupiter and Saturn, I'm going to say more about Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, they're in the south southwestern evening sky. They're, they're very low in the twilight. Uh, and they, there's a challenging close conjunction on December 21st. And uh, there's a picture there of Saturn. I mean, I've had a bit of a debate with uh, Paul Gray about this, about whether, you know, whether, you know, to the unaided eye, whether they, people are going to be able to pick them out because they're only like six minutes apart. But to be honest with you, I've never seen anything that the two items that bright so close together. So I really don't know how my eye and brain are going to interact. I think it's going to be a very interesting challenge to see whether you can see them separately or not. So um, I'm not saying you will. I, Paul's talking about, he, he says, people with average vision will be able to pick them apart, but almost half of us have less than average vision. <laughs> so it'll be an interesting uh, evening. Um, right. Um, I'll say, I'm actually going to say more about that. Uh, and I've already mentioned Uranus and Neptune. So, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn on December 21st. This is an, a simulation from uh, uh, Sky Safari. And I would say, generally speaking, it would be if what you can see in a high magnification telescope. Um, so if you catch it at the right time. Um, now there's one proviso. It's going to be very low in the evening sky. So you're going to have to find yourself a spot that you can, it's only going to be several degrees above the horizon. So, you know, the seeing might be a bit wonky, but you should, I mean, this is the actual arrangement of, of the, the, the planets and their satellites. So you should be able to take this all in, in a high magnification view in a, in a decent telescope. So if you can imagine what Jupiter looks like and what Saturn looks like in your telescope, this is what they would look like together. I, I think it's worth a try. And you might even try the night before as well. So, um, a high power view, in other words, about a half a degree across. That will depend on your telescope and your eyepiece selection. Low to the horizon. I would say you should start looking just after sunset because they're fairly bright and you can pick up Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, in, if you know where to look, you can pick them up in uh, binoculars and telescopes long before you can see them with your eyes. So it's worth looking as soon as you can. Um, and I've got this closest since 2000, May 31st. Well, um, uh, there's a kind of a 20 year cycle uh, of these um, conjunctions. And then uh, some of the years is actually a triple conjunction. I don't wanna go into the details of it. It's pretty interesting though. So this is very rare that they're this close. It, it is really, I would say once in a lifetime. Uh, so it's, it's worth taking the time. And I'm looking at Jupiter and Saturn now, like at quarter after five, I'd be in looking. So too bad it's at supper time, but it's worth taking the time if it's clear. The other event this year is the Geminid meteor shower. Well, every year, but this year um, it's, it's like the, it's, it's a Sunday, Monday night uh, Sunday into Monday, uh, you can begin looking earlier than that. Geminids have a sharp rise and a long fall off, I think. Maybe Paul can correct me, or is it the other way around? Anyway, it's a pretty sharp rise to the to the um, to the, to the peak. Uh, you know, uh, practical observed rates, I would say, are about twenty-five meters. You'll you'll see bigger numbers for zenith hourly rate, but that's not. A practical number. Uh, they tend to have long, slow tracks. The, the nice thing about this meteor shower is that the dust, it gets dark very early. There's no moon this year and the radiant is rising uh, at about, well I've got a 10 o'clock clock there, but the radiant is rising quite early in the evening. Plus, I believe it actually, the, the so-called peak of the thing is in the early evening hours. So it really is worth look going out again if it's clear and trying to see if you can see some geminid meteors. You might even drag some of your family members out. They might be able to see a few. Um, of course, it's always good to try to get to a dark sky. They're also photo worthy if you want if you're into that. It's now known that they're um, associated with minor planet 3200 Python rather than a comet, which if you get into the science of it, it could explain why they look a little bit different than other meteors. 
So, uh, well, there's another minor shower on the December 21st, 22nd, the Ursid meteors, but you have to be a real meteor nut to uh, take that in. But uh, I mean, some of the showers they talk about are like 10, 10 per hour and, and the sporadic rate is about six. So um, the only thing that distinguishes the showers is that they come from a radiant, but uh, the, the minor showers aren't too spectacular. What, um, what's next? I'm gonna go through, uh, uh, we're into a new season. Uh, I'm saying it's already winter, <laughs> despite the temperature outside and the fact that my garlic is already growing in my bed. Uh, it's, uh, so I'm, we're doing the winter constellations, winter uh, things. So it's fairly easy to pull out the winter constellations. They follow more or less the winter hexagon, uh, in fact. So Auriga, Gemini, Taurus, Orion, Canis Major and Canis Minor are the principal constellations in ETU. Fairly easy to rack those up on a nice clear evening. Um, the stars again, uh, uh, all of these are uh, in the hexagon or the triangle. Uh, beats me why they put in Gomieza, which is Beta, beta Canis major, Minoris, why they felt that that was a more significant star than, you know, some of the other ones there. But I guess a lot of the constellations have two stars and Canis Minor, uh, other than Procyon, doesn't really have much going on. So I guess they picked that one out, but it's an oddball. So the interesting thing is there's quite a lot of, you know, bright stars in the winter sky. Like there's the ranking over on the right. So there, that's the ranking starting with number one is Sirius. Uh, so you can see that there's quite a few uh, stars there in the top 50, uh, out of the top 50. And all of those, uh, except Castor and Gomeza, all of those are navigation stars that are used in celestial navigation. And all of them are in the SINSCAN uh, list of stars for doing telescope alignment. So, so it's worthwhile uh, learning these if you have one of those SINSCAN telescopes. I'm not sure about other telescopes, but when you, do, when you do the sky alignment with the telescope, they often give you the name of the star. And if you don't, you don't know the names of your stars, you're kind of sunk. So it's worth kind of learning these names. What's one reason why, in fact, to do the Explore the Universe program is to learn the names of the stars, um, just so that you can find your way around. And sure, use your go-to telescope, but you have to learn how to point it, right? Um, as far as deep sky is concerned, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, for the Explore the Universe, it's mostly open clusters. Uh, so Pleiades and Hyades are there. There's a whole string of open clusters along the winter Milky Way. Orion Nebula is the oddball because it's a nebula, but it's fair, very easy to see. I mean, you can see it with your unaided eye and in binoculars shows up quite well, even in the city. Uh, the, the, uh, the real oddball is the Kemble's Cascade, which is really an asterism. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, Father Lucien Kemble was a Canadian member of the RESC and um, uh, he was a, a, a priest in the, in the Catholic church. And I never met him, but I did correspond with him and he had a cute little, he had his own note paper, a letter paper, and he had a, a drawing of Campbell's Cascade up at the top of his letterhead. So I've got a letter from him on this paper and I've, I keep that in my files because it was kind of a cute thing. Um, so it's an asterism that he noticed and uh, it's named after him. Uh, it's in Camelo Pardalus or something. I think that's the, the constellation. Now there is one interesting um, component of the cascade. So you can see in the, in the picture there, you can see this string of stars. Now down near the, the bottom, uh, there is actually a, an actual star cluster, NGC 1502. And um, now you will see a fuzzy spot in binoculars, but to really get a good view of that, you'd need a telescope. So the challenge is, uh, I think, it's easy enough to find those other things. The challenge is to find Kemble's Cascade and see if you can find uh, NGC 1502 as well. It's fun, it's fun to do. I, sometimes when I'm just tooling around the sky with binoculars when I'm camping, 
if I can't see the southern sky, I just say, well, let's see what we can find in the northern sky. And I sometimes come across Kemmel's Cascade. It's a little difficult to find in that there's no real bright stars around it. You have to kind of just scan around and look for it. If anybody knows of a, a system for finding it, let me know. Um, <laughs> the autumn and winter double stars are an interesting set. Um, it, it includes 16 Cygni, which I would say would be more of a summer object, but I guess it's high enough up that you can, you can see it. Um, there's not a ton of double stars in the ETU for autumn and winter. Um, so again, the, the one that's probably easy to find and uh, would be interesting to look at is Delta Cepheus because it's a very historically important star. You know, it's an important variable star. It also happens to be a double star. So try to find that one at least. And that's the end of my presentation for today. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Not so much a question, but I know Melody taught me how to find it using um, Cassiopeia. So I'll, I'll send that along to you, Dave. Um, yeah, um, no, I know she has a story about, she has a whole story about uh, Campbell's Cascade because I think she discovered the cluster and uh, she, she, she did the observation and then she kind of discovered that there was a cluster there as well. And it was kind of an eye-opening experience. So. Yeah, that's what started her sketching. So just before, if there aren't any more questions, I mean, I'm happy to, to take them. I just want to say again about the conjunction. Um, it, it is a bit of a challenge, but if you start looking now on every clear night and you know where, kind of where to look, like you can quickly figure out if your house is in a good place to, to look at this. As, as the days pass on and get closer to the 21st, this, the two planets are going to get lower in the sky, closer to the sun, and more towards the north, uh, more, more northerly. So if you can see them now, great, uh, but you might find it harder and harder. So scout out a place around your community, preferably somewhere high up with a low horizon that you can get to fairly quickly. Um, if you can take a small telescope with you, great, because you might be able to see those telescopes, or sorry, those planets in the telescope. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not something that happens in an instant. So you can kind of see this unfold and watch it as it, um, as it, gets, um, as it gets closer and closer. Okay. I just pop in? Yep. yep. Dave, you're asking about meteor showers. The Geminids should be good no matter what that night, all night yeah. long. The peak for those are actually quite broad, so that yeah. six hours the peak either side, and you shouldn't notice any difference. The later at night, the better, of course, because the rates go up higher in the morning. But yeah, when I <laughs> when I talk to the public about it, you know, like no nobody's going to be interested in looking no. at outside very late, but. I mean, that's one of the nice things about the Geminids is if it's a nice clear night and it's not too cold, you can get your kids outside and they have a, a, a fighting chance of seeing the meteors. The Perseids the the are meteors. great, but you have to wait up so late before it gets dark, yeah. you know, to, to see the meteors. But at least Geminids, they kind of start right after dinner kind of thing. Yeah, the the, the Eurysids, I just wanted to add there, again, it's for the diehards, but, um, the 2020 meteor shower calendar from the IMO list uh, references a Jeniskin's uh, paper back in 06 that has us encountering two dust trails from 829 and 815, um, which are ones we haven't encountered in quite some time, actually. And they are on December 22nd at 6 hours UT, so 3 a.m. our time for the 829 dust trail, the 815 dust trail, somewhere between three hours and 22 hours. So they're really not sure when we're gonna encounter that one. But the interesting thing is, is the ZHRs are prospectively 490 and 420. Oh, wow. Very short lived for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but the, so I'm thinking the 829 dust trail at 3 a.m might be worth popping out for a half hour, an hour, see if anything's happening. So that's the night, which night of the 20th? The morning of the 22nd, so the evening of the 21st. 
So the night of the twenty first. After, after you've seen the uh, after you've seen the conjunction and uh, observed the half moon and have a nap. Have a nap. Uh, that's the kind of crazy thing. In the morning, go out again and take a peek and watch for ten or fifteen minutes. So yeah, it might be a bit of a display. Is that but the again, it's it's a real question as to what that timing is and how accurate it is. Okay. Uh, it's questionable, well, so but the, um, I haven't seen anything new on it. This was all posted back in January. Okay. I expect in the next week there'll be some article coming out on it. Uh, so everything's being overshadowed by the conjunction. Somebody asked me recently, you know, Chapman, how how do you, uh, you know, how do you how can you manage to stay up in, in the middle of the night and see all this stuff and then kind of carry out a normal life? I said, well, first of all, I don't have a normal life. I'm in retirement. Okay. And then secondly, I said, astronomers observe when they have to and they sleep when they can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for that again, Dave. Uh, great presentation today and throughout the past year. Thanks so much for everything you do in that regard. Um, just have a couple of things I want to announce before we close. Number one is a reference to the Nova Notes. The September-October edition is now online and people were apprised of its availability on earlier this month and in the email. So you can see the latest edition. There will be a November-December edition come out uh, through Charles. So if any of you have anything you would like to contribute to the uh, November, December issue, please get in touch with Charles ASAP with, with what you would like to uh, include. And other than that, uh, our next members meeting is Saturday, January 9, same place, same station. And for the board members, new and incoming, new to the board, uh, our next meeting will be Thursday, January 7. So Everyone will be apprised of the meetings and agenda come the new year. So all the best to everyone over the holiday season, to you and your families. Stay safe, stay healthy, and remember to always look up. And with that, we're going to stop the recording. And from now until 5 o'clock, we have Astro Chat. <laughs>